32,000 feet over the Gulf of Riga, a NATO surveillance aircraft turns lazy circles in a moonless sky. The crew aboard are on alert, their powerful radar peering deep into Russian territory at the suspicious forces massing for what the Kremlin has called a snap military exercise. NATO is skeptical, with Russian President Dmitry Kozak's recent military expansion and his bellicose threats against the West, the thin but potent NATO forces in the Baltics are wary and have responded by increasing their readiness. In Washington, President Dalman and his administration are dismissive of NATO's concern, believing Russia incapable of mounting offensive operations in Europe. Instead, the Dalman administration's primary attention is fixed on the Pacific Rim and the ongoing struggle there for regional dominance against China. Aboard the surveillance aircraft over the Baltics, NATO's worries are confirmed on August 3rd, when radar operators identify a wave of incoming tactical ballistic missiles from the east. Their trajectories and points of impact are soon determined. The missiles are headed for the Baltics. As one of the radar operators put it, buckle up kids, here comes the pain. The war that many believed improbable had begun. The Russian offensive began with a rain of missiles and long-range artillery fire, targeting facilities throughout Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Airports, radar and power stations, fuel depots, ammunition storage facilities and surface-to-air missile batteries were simultaneously struck. Russian aircraft followed, bombing targets and overwhelming the few defending aircraft that were able to get off the ground. With the skies momentarily cleared, leading elements of the Russian ground offensive began their assault. In the north, along Highway E20 near the city of Narva, Estonian ground forces fought hard against the onslaught of Russian tanks, infantry fighting vehicles and attack helicopters, all under the withering support of artillery and rocket fire. Lieutenant Jan Lukas of the Estonian ground forces described the chaos in the battle for Narva. Almost immediately, our vehicle was hit by a missile. Only me and the driver were able to get out. We got picked up by another vehicle and hadn't gone 100 meters when it was also hit by a missile. This time, nobody made it out but me. Only reason I'm not dead or a POW is because a civilian who was positively mental picked me up and got me out of there while under fire. Suffering significant losses, the defenders were eventually driven west but their efforts gave valuable time for follow-on forces to gather and prepare for the defense of the city of Yovi, considered critical in faltering the Russians' northern advance. While in the south from Kaliningrad, Russian forces made rapid work of overwhelming and destroying the small Lithuanian tripwire defense force staged at the city of Kaibata. To the city's east, combined Lithuanian and NATO ground forces prepared positions in the city of Mariampol for tough fighting ahead. But the largest Russian assault was focused on eastern Latvia and their goal of seizing the capital city of Riga within the war's first 60 hours. Doing so would effectively cut the Baltics in half, leaving Estonia and Lithuania isolated and desperately vulnerable to defeat. Standing in the Russians' way was a NATO battalion strength multinational battle group, led by Canadian Lieutenant Colonel Ryan Bournette. Anticipating the Russians' plan, Bornet had the bulk of his forces staged near the Latvian city of Rzeknia. Over a live emergency video conference, US President Dalman and other NATO heads of state were given a briefing by NATO command, including by Lieutenant Colonel Bornet from his temporary headquarters in Rzeknia. Bornet made it clear that holding Rzeknia was critical. The bulk of the Russian attack will be directed here, he told the gathering. If we hold Rzeknia, we stall the Russians. We stall them? they lose. Looking for reassurance, President Dalman asked Bornet directly of his chances of holding the city until reinforcements from Poland and elsewhere could arrive. Bornet was confident. We will hold. The Lieutenant Colonel's video feed suddenly ceased. It would later be determined that Russian hackers had accessed Bornet's personal phone months prior, giving Russian intelligence real-time access to Bornet's location. 
Breaking strict security rules, Bornet's personal phone was in his pocket in the opening hours of the Russian attack. Three hypersonic missiles slammed into his building. President Dalman, desperate for an update, finally received confirmation of Bornet's fate three hours later. The Lieutenant Colonel, his aides and leading officers were dead. Horrified, the stricken president was heard to say, this is disaster upon disaster. The decapitating attack left Bornet's brigade stunned, shaken but resolute. Digging in, they prepared for the brutal fight soon to come. <laughs>